welcome all of you today to the annual Children's Guardian Fund luncheon. I'm Carol Belmont and I am the vice chair of the Children's Guardian Fund. The one thing I was asked to tell everybody, which we're really pleased about, is DeSoto, Manatee, and Sarasota counties all have proclaimed this Thursday, November 17th, Children's Guardian Fund Day with proclamations. So that's, that's really an honor for us because I can say two years ago we didn't get any publicity. <laughs> And now it's, it's really starting to happen, thanks to all of you. And then our first speaker will be Andrea McHugh, who is our chair of the Children's Guardian Fund. Andrea. Good afternoon and welcome. Thank you for being here. I wanted to start today by thanking um, a lot of important people in the room. So first I wanna uh, thank Betty Ewing, who is our um, our honorary luncheon chair. Thank you, Betty. Go ahead and stand up so everyone can see you. And we have a wonderful honorary host committee as well. If you can turn your um, attention to the screen, we have Robert and Willa Bernard, Cynthia Craig, Wendy Cox, Henry and Charlotte Hinman. If you all can stand while I'm saying your name so that we can all see you and we'll clap for you at the end. Joy Holloway Salter, Michael Jarday. William and Elizabeth Johnston, Ginger Judge, Grassi McGillicuddy, Mike Mickelson, Jane Newman, Mark Scharf, Judy Sharple, Carol and Morton Siegler. If you could all give them a round of applause. So my name is Andrea McHugh and I'm proud to be the president of the Children's Guardian Fund this year. I'm a prosecutor and I've spent the majority of my career prosecuting crimes against children. You're here today to support this program because you support kids that have been removed from their families, from their homes, from the people that they know, from the lives that they know. And kids are being removed at an alarming rate. The removal rate is up 25% in Sarasota and Manatee counties. And that's due in large part, I'm sure you've read the newspapers, to the heroin and the drug epidemic that is really impacting our, our communities. How many of you have seen that picture that's gone around social media of the two parents who have overdosed in the front seat of the car with the sweet little four-year-old boy in the back seat? Well, that's really happening here, and it's happening a lot. Kids are not just being removed from families that are having parents die of overdoses, but of course, along with drug use comes uh, an element of neglect or abuse of those children. And it's a good thing that these children are being removed and put into safe environments. We all recognize that. But for the children who go through it, it's very scary. It's very disruptive to their lives. They don't know it's coming a lot of times, and they don't have a lot of choices in what happens. Strangers come into their lives and decide who they're going to live with, where they're going to go to school, what items they're allowed to take with them, and it's a very temporary and a very transitional period for them. It's, it's alarming, especially kids of all people. Kids like structure and kids like routine. So who are the people that are making these decisions? Who are the strangers that come in and make these decisions for the children? Well, you're going to hear from a lot of them today. You're going to hear from these heroes that really have boots on the ground making a difference in these kids' lives in the most critical time in their lives when they've just been removed from their families and their whole future is ahead of them. And you're, you'll hear from a case manager, a foster parent, a guardian, and finally you'll hear from a young person who went through this journey so that you can see it through their eyes. And of course today you're going to hear how the Children's Guardian Fund has supported foster kids and children that are removed from their families through this process. So we thank you very much for being here today. At this point I'm going to ask Carol Belmont to come up and introduce our speakers a little more specifically. Again, welcome. I hope you'll enjoy your lunch. It was, I had a bite of each. It's pretty tasty. <laughs> um, as Andrea said, today we're going to talk about the process that our children go through. And we have three key, key players in that process who will be speaking to you. And those are the investigator and the case manager. 
We will have a guardian ad litem, and we will have a foster parent. And I actually had the opportunity to hear most of these people in rehearsal, and they really touched my heart, as I'm sure they will touch your heart. And then we also have a youth speaker who has uh, benefited from the Children's Guardian Fund and who is also going to share his experience with you from foster care to where he is now. And I am so proud of him. But our first speaker is Angela Murray. And Angela is, has multi-certifications as a child welfare specialist. She's a protective investigation supervisor. She's a trainer and quality assurance reviewer with over 27 years of experience. She has been with the Sarasota Family YMCA Safe Children's Coalition since 2007. Angela also facilitates at College University of Phoenix both classroom and online coursework in ethics, psychology, and human services. So I'd like to welcome Angela Murray. Thank you. Good afternoon. Can everyone hear me? Good. All right. So what they asked me to do today was to give you just a little piece of the picture of how the children become involved with child welfare. And basically what happens is a call goes to the hotline because one of you or someone in society, they have a concern. And if the call is serious enough, they'll send that information down and an investigator will get assigned. That investigator goes out and they determine whether or not the child or children are safe or unsafe. While they're doing that, they're looking at a few things. They're looking at what protective factors do the parents have. Those are things like ability to put their children's needs before their own, ability to make sure the basic needs are met, ability to protect their children from paramours or boyfriends, girlfriends that may harm them. Those are protective factors. They also look at child vulnerability. How old are the children? Are they infants? Can they talk? Can they tell us what's happening to them? Or do they have a disability? Something that makes them unable to actually tell us what's going on for them and, and that they're being harmed. So the investigator goes out, they look at all those things. Once they determine the situation is unsafe, then they have to determine can we keep the family together by putting supports in place through the church, through the neighbors, through friends, extended family? Or do we have to, for the children to stay safe and not be harmed, remove the children? And then when we remove them, can we find relatives or non-relatives to keep the children? Or do they have to go to a foster home? So they work through all of those processes. And while they're doing that, we're relying on each other and on, on everyone to make sure we're making those right choices and they're hard choices. Because we love our families and we want to be together, but also we want to make sure we keep our children safe. And that's why you all are here, because you want to keep our children safe and you want to help them have normalcy. In Bradenton, a man was charged with the death of his, his girlfriend's four-year-old son went to jury trial April 2015. It was the child's fourth birthday and he suffered a blunt trauma to his head and torso. Most of you know about Kenesha Thomas and the fate she suffered. One of the siblings of that child wrote a letter to the judge. In the letter she states, this letter is to tell my sister's story for her, because she didn't get to tell you guys what my mom did to her. It's my turn to tell you the truth. The truth includes repeated abuse of Janiya at the hands of her own mother, Kenesha Thomas. Janiya was tied up by the hands and wrists, and her head was dunked in nasty bath and toilet water. The letter also describes a time Janiya, who was underfed, escaped the house and dug through a neighbor's trash cans for food. The last part of the letter talks about 
the siblings seeing their sister's body lifeless and dead on the bathroom floor. All of these things happen because of our society right now and mostly because we're dealing with as was mentioned before. We have the not so proud honor of Manatee County being number one in the state for deaths. Number one for deaths due to opioids, heroin overdoses. Number two, Sarasota. You don't think it's in our backyard here in Sarasota, but it is. The charts on the wall, if you look at them, the red and the green are the highest volume of death per capita, and they're our circuit. Fentanyl is one of the reasons these deaths are happening more. It's a pain medication that they're using to cut into the heroin because it's cheaper to attain. Carfentanil is a stronger version of it. It's an elephant tranquilizer. They can't even train and won't train police dogs to sniff out this carfentanil because the toxicity it has and it could, could result in death. What's her name? Oh, hey, just give what is, I don't know. I don't even know her. She had a pulse. Right. I don't know her. She had a good pulse? Her the lips are when blue. When I checked, all right. Her color's coming back a little bit, though, because she was totally freaking blue for a minute. Do you know her? Yeah. It's my sister. It's your sister? Oh, my God. What you're seeing here is a heroin overdose. Come on, baby. What's her Give name? 25 deaths per every 100,000 in Manatee County. 15 per every 100,000 in Sarasota County. How long has she been here? Dr. Vega, the medical examiner. A number of autopsies, so many autopsies. They have no place for the bodies right now. What, did she get out of a car or something? Were you walking? Oh, okay. I had had a pulse when you were pulling up. What they're doing is administering Narcan. That's the solution. Come on, baby. Come on. With this Narcan, also known as naloxone, it blocks the opioids. It allows people to be resuscitated and come back to life from a heroin or opioid overdose. Here come the ambulance. Oh, God. Yes, sir. Manatee County administered over 800 doses of Narcan this year. 800 doses. Some, two in the same day on the same person. Just think about that for a minute. 279 doses in September alone, which is three times what it was last year. That Narcan or Naloxone that just, you just saw, Pharmacies have started carrying it now. Our street officers are being trained how to use it too. They're talking about training our case managers on educating the families of pa parents who overdose frequently and their loved ones on how to get the over-the-counter prescription and keep it on hand. It's not a needle, it doesn't get injected, you just do some CPR, put it in both nostrils, and they can live. These parents that are overdosing are parents. Just like Andrea mentioned, the children are sometimes in the car. And that's not just in Maine or Ohio or wherever that happened. That happened right here in Bradenton last month. Two kids in the car, two parents overdosing. I think it was a Burger King. Right in the car. Our vulnerable children are age four and under. Our circuit alone serves almost 1,500 children. We've had 950 of those children removed from their parents, and 320 of them right now are in foster homes or group homes. We actually only have 248 licensed beds. We need foster parents. We need you to become foster parents if you can, and if not you, then someone you know. We really need for our children to be in foster homes that are not overcrowded, and to get the care that they need. Although we have the shortage of homes, 71% of our children that are siblings are placed together. 
which is amazing. So this girl on the wall, her name's Nikki. One of the other things I do in the time that I don't have is I volunteer and I mentor because I think it's import important. I think what our guardians do is important. I think what everyone in this room is doing is important in whatever way we're helping. Nikki in the middle, that's what she looked like when I first met her, wore hoodies. She actually had stitches drawn on her face in black ink when she went to court and she wore those same stitches to the Holocaust Museum our first time we went to the Holocaust Museum with a swastika on her neck, which was very interesting. But the pictures on the sides are where she's at now. She's 19, she's doing well. She's trying to do better for herself, it's still a struggle. One of the things the Guardian Fund did is she's also an amazing artist. The Guardian Fund paid for her to go to Ringling for summer camp for art. Your money that you contribute to this fund helped have her go from that very, very dark place to a place where she's smiling with cake on her nose. And it's pretty amazing, the change that we see in our children when the right people help. So the next person who's going to be speaking is also an amazing person, and I'm going to let them tell you about her, but she's also a good friend of mine, and I think you will enjoy her. Thank you. So now, who we have for a speaker, and I did hear her speak, is Abby Krause. Abby is a foster parent, and her partner had been par foster parents in Manatee County since January 2014. They have taken 12 long-term placements and 36 emergency placements or respite care. They currently have four children in foster care, three, eight, 12, and 14, and are in the process of adopting two of the children, Abby. Thank you. Good morning. Many ask, why do you foster? I merely say, why not? Many also ask, isn't it scary? Foster kids are bad. My response to this has changed dramatically. I used to get really upset and frustrated, but I realized it wasn't their fault. Foster children are portrayed in a negative way. Now I use this to enlighten them in hopes that maybe with each person who asks me questions, just one will be a foster parent. Providing a home <clears throat> for any child is rewarding. It is a blessing to watch children grow into many versions of yourself. This can also be very scary. <laughs> when our three-year-old started to tisk at me, I almost lost it. <laughs> then I realized I'm the one that was tisking. Now we just laugh. Of course, with every journey, there is hardship, challenge, obstacles, but it is not the children. We have found two major hurdles since we started fostering. The education system and having unlimited access to activities that build strong foundations. Most of the children we have taken have been at least a year behind academically, if not more. Whether it's a seven-year-old who can't write an alphabet or a 17-year-old reading at a fourth grade level, it becomes your job to overcome that. Without these activities or hobbies kids enjoy, it is nearly impossible to keep any child motivated enough to overcome battles that even adults struggle with. Children's Guardian Fund has really fostered the gap between providing good care and providing great care. These children, they don't need to be the top of their class or the best at the sports they play. They just need to believe that it's possible. Failure is essential, but when it's been the only thing that they know, it's just easier for them. Sometimes they'll create failure, then try and fail. With the support of CGF, it is possible to teach them that failure is a part of life, that there's value in failing. The success is merely that they did try and that they didn't quit. 
This certainly is easy for me to say. Someone who was raised by two parents and didn't have any abuse and neglect growing up. Without CGF fostering that gap, rebuilding the broken foundation is nearly impossible. CGF, CGF has provided our children the opportunities to play sports, improve their education, but most importantly, it has provided us an opportunity to create strong family ties. We merely had to devote our time and dedication and CGF covered the rest. The most significant impact CGF has had on one of our children was making family vacations possible. And with four to five children, that's not always easy. Try driving 30 plus hours in the car with five kids. You just try to make it to the end point with them all alive. Thanks to CGF, we've uh, rented an RV two years in a row, which has left an everlasting impression on a child that I didn't even realize until recently. We took John in January of 2015. He was the first child that was not in our identified age range. We started foster care to provide care for teenage boys because we knew without us, they wouldn't otherwise have a chance in a home. John was 11 going on 12 when we took him. John had the strongest foundation of any child we ever took. That was with regard to education and confidence. But his family bond was shattered, gripped by lies and letdowns. John was the easiest placement we ever took. And by easy, I mean we didn't spend five hours at the dining room table catching him up in school or teaching him how to socially interact with other people. He was goofy, confident, loved dancing, singing, and sports. He was a history buff full of knowledge. Every day I would wait to hear, Abby, did you know? And it usually ended with, no, I didn't. <laughs> John was, is a member of Junior Thespians at Manatee School for the Arts. He's played soccer at Brain River Soccer Club through the help of CGF. He never needed to be the best on the team because he worked harder than anyone else. And he never gave up, a skill that takes years to acquire. A few months prior to his reunification with his mother, we took an RV trip to Minnesota to see our family. We stopped at theme parks, attractions, historical sites, but what, what made an impact on him was being with our family. He would make comments about how it made him miss his mother and how he wished his family was like ours in regards to being close and together. We continued to reassure him that this would always be family, but in the end, these children, they never give up on their parents. John went home last year just before Thanksgiving, about six months Following his reunification, I received a call at 1 a.m. John was back in care. They brought him over the next day, and when he walked through that door, I was crushed. That happy-go-lucky, won't-quit, will dance his, till his legs fall off, was gone. He was angry, broken, resentful, defeated. He was not dancing or singing. He was just angry. But who could blame him, right? A few weeks went by and each day, the internal light started to get brighter and brighter. He started to transform back into the John that we knew. Without CGF, that seed of family connection and bond would have never been planted. John has since moved with his grandparents and is doing great. About two months ago, John sent me a message that left me speechless. Hey Abby, and to the boys, I just wanted to give you the greatest thanks to you guys. I'm doing the best I ever did in school, and it was because of the d discipline and the loving hard work you gave me in the past. I just wanted to spread the love, and I wanted to thank you for everything. I'm writing stories about my life and singing songs about my life, and I just wanted you guys to know that I love you so much. So no, when you donate to CGF, you are not donating, you are changing lives of children who without you don't always have that chance. I personally want to thank you because all of my children have grown tremendously because of your support. I would like to take a moment to have my guests stand. John is an inspiration to me and so many others. He's the definition of a fighter who will never give up. He shows the world daily. He is amazing, and I love him. Thank you.
told you this would be heart-wrenching. <laughs> just to have people like that in community, in our community, who donates their time and their life to these children, I just don't even know how we could thank you enough. It was great, Abby. Our next speaker is Jasmine Canlish. Jasmine is a wife, a mother of four, a grandmother of 12. In her professional life, she's the author of 70 published novels, written as she followed her businessman husband around the world. Since settling in Sarasota, she has served on the board of the United Way, acted as president of the Children's Guardian Fund, and is currently a member of the Children's Guardian Fund Advisory Board. She has been a, also a guardian ad litem for six years, and she's going to tell us some stories about her life as a guardian ad litem. And I've gotten to know Jasmine through our board, and she's a wonderful person. Thank you, Jasmine. Sixteen years ago, one of our daughters decided to become a foster parent. Although I'd always been interested in how society chooses to care for its most vulnerable members, this was the first time I had the chance to observe the foster care system in a close and personal way. Watching my daughter's experiences as a foster mom, I soon realized that almost everything I knew about the system was either wrong or irrelevant. I also learned that until you hear the personal histories of children coming into care, it's almost impossible to imagine the depth and breadth of the suffering some children silently endure right here in our own community. From my new vantage point, I also began to understand the importance of the Guardian Ad Litem program which represents the interests of children in dependency as they make way, their way through the tangles of our legal system. In most states, the program is staffed by professional attorneys employed by the government. I was surprised to learn that in Florida, guardians are volunteers who come from all walks of life and many different professional backgrounds. I was drawn to the idea of volunteering as a guardian and perhaps making a real difference in the lives of children who had endured far too much. However, I was a bit hesitant to take the plunge since a professional life spent creating works of commercial fiction didn't seem like the ideal background for somebody hoping to guide disadvantaged children through the court system. I eventually overcame my doubts, applied, was accepted, and went through the initial training program. The learning curve was steep. It was intimidating to realize that the guardian ad litem doesn't just have to have good intentions. She's working within a legal system, and we were taught that although we always strive to find the best possible outcome for each individual child, we are also obligated to work within the law. The good news is that like all volunteers, I had professional supervisors and experienced lawyers to ensure I didn't make any huge legal gaffes. And of course, the more cases you work, the more you understand the complicated web of rules and laws that cover the lives of children in dependency. I was excited but nervous when I was assigned my first case. Two young boys whose father had been so high when he dropped them off at school that he caused a major car crash. Mom was later discovered at home almost comatose from drugs. When I was handed the case, the boys were in the care of their maternal grandmother, the dad had disappeared, and mom was in jail. Luckily for me, and even more luckily for the boys in question, I didn't have to decide how to tackle my first case alone. The great and good Bob Merrill was assigned as my mentor, and he suggested that since the mom was in jail, this would be a very good time for me to meet her. After all, we knew exactly where she was, <laughs> which in some cases is more than you can hope for. You may not be surprised to learn that visiting an inmate of Manatee County Jail had not previously formed part of my life experiences. <laughs> Truth be told, 
I wasn't at all sure that I was up for spending an afternoon visiting the jail. But Bob Merrill seemed to expect me to jump right in on this, and I didn't want to fail at the first hurdle. So once he explained to me how I could go online and get a jail identification number, I set up a visit and arranged to see the mom the next day. Thankfully, Bob also needed to visit one of his clients, so we at least drove together, and I was able to pretend that I was entirely cool with this jail visiting thing. <laughs> Meeting the mom via video phone was an, an unnerving experience for me. She looked wild-eyed and zoned out. In other words, she looked exactly the way I expected a drug-addicted mom who neglected her kids to look. On top of that, she spent most of the time complaining that she didn't have any money in her jail account to buy shampoo. Since I had no clue that jail inmates are expected to buy many of the toiletries they need beyond soap, I literally didn't understand what she was talking about. To make matters worse, she clearly had no idea what a guardian ad litem did, and frankly, I wasn't too sure myself. <laughs> so the visit didn't achieve much, except to confirm my opinion that there was zero chance this mom would get her act together and get her kids back. This snap judgment was merely the first time, but sadly not the last, that I got everything wrong at the beginning of a case. I'm happy to report that after 15 months of hard work, residential counseling, AA meetings, and therapy sessions, that wild-eyed, junky mother ended up clean, sober, and gainfully employed for the requisite full six months. She was lucky enough to have supportive parents who helped to clear up the delinquent mortgage on her house, and her two sons moved back into the family home with her. The family, is still together and doing well five years later. The grandparents in this case were financially comfortable and although the boys needed an advocate, they didn't need actual financial support from Children's Guardian Fund. This isn't usually the case. Often there is dire financial need in addition to all the other problems. Last year, we showed guests at our fall luncheon a picture of an infant in his brand new crib bought by the Children's Guardian Fund because the grandmother taking care of him had already sold her truck to provide basic necessities and now had no funds left to buy him a bed. I thought you might enjoy seeing a picture of that same infant today, enjoying time in the park as he prepares to be formally adopted by his grandmother. Perhaps these happy endings, which are more typical than you might expect, explain why I find the ro my role as guardian not just fulfilling, but also joyful. I use the word joyful advisedly. True, I've seen parents at their irresponsible worst, and I've handled far too many cases involving babies born addicted to crack, hero heroin, and miscellaneous other dangerous drugs. Maybe I've just been extraordinarily lucky but I've seen those self-same babies grow and flourish with the help of loving members of their extended families, or sometimes with the help of devoted foster parents. And here is a picture of another one of my babies whose foster parents are hoping to adopt him. He looks pretty happy. <laughs> Even when the outcome isn't quite so wonderful, it's gratifying to know that as a volunteer guardian, I've played a part in making sure that the best possible outcome has been achieved for some of our community's most vulnerable members. Thankfully, more often than not, we guardians witness not just the best outcome that can be hoped for in a miserable situation. Instead, we witness the miracle of young lives turned around and children given the promise of a fresh start and a normal childhood. I'm really glad I volunteered. Thank you, Jasmine. That was wonderful. 
Our next speaker is Jesse Durant. Jesse aged out of the foster care system a year ago. He is working part-time at Sunset Cadillac and attending culinary school. Please welcome Jesse Durant, who will share his story. Everybody's story is different, but I feel that there is a common misconception uh, or stereotype that arises when the words foster care are uttered. When I was younger, when I heard the phrase foster care, one of three things would pop up in my head. Drug abuse, domestic violence, or parents being deceased. And sometimes that might fit the bill, but I'm here to say that there is a much wider array of circumstances that lead to being put into the foster care program. To prove this, I'll share my story with you. <clears throat> my senior year of high school had just started, and I was in all honors classes. My summer had been great, but my grandmother needed help, so my mom and I were preparing to leave our house and move in with her on the other side of town. One evening, <clears throat> while I was at home studying, my mom came into my room. She said that she understood why I was trying to act like nothing was going on so I could focus on school. But ignoring the situation didn't change the fact that we were moving in a few days. She asked me to at least pack up my bathroom. I answered that I was slammed with homework and would make sure it got done before I turned in for the night. She insisted that I do it now. My mom yelled if I didn't start packing right this moment, she would begin ripping pages out of my textbook. Finances were pretty tight in our household, but in my head I was trying to figure out why that would be an answer to anything, since she constantly reminded me that we didn't have any money and were struggling to make ends meet. I barely ached for a few moments, but finally got up to start packing. She didn't like the way I was packing, and one thing led to another until the situation got out of hand. My mom had my book in her hand. I tried to get away from her, and we fell. I fell on top of her and my textbook. Later on, I learned that fall had fractured her ribs. At the end of all this mess, I ended up getting arrested and charged with domestic violence. Those charges were put on me by the state and not by my mother. I spent about a month in DJJ, the Department of Juvenile Justice, before going back to court and being put into foster care. At the court hearing, the judge said that my mom had a choice to make, to either take me back home or let me go into foster care. He pointed out that my terrible temper and anger had gotten untreated and that I should have a mental evaluation to see what was really going on. My mom chose not to take me back so I could receive the help and treatment that I needed to get over my anger, and that is how I ended up in foster care. Once in foster care, I was placed in a house located in Tampa, Brandon, and the Brandon area. Uh, thankfully, I was there for less than a month because it was just terrible. The house was filthy. The three other boys that were there did whatever they wanted. Fights occurred almost daily and would last as long as an hour, if not more. The staff did nothing but sit in their office and take personal calls and play games on their phone. Thank God I was eventually relocated to AMI Kids Crossroads in Punta Gora. The move was a godsend. Even though AMI is located in the middle of nowhere, it was 100% better. They had school and therapist on site. The staff were caring and helpful. The 23 other boys came from all over the state and the atmosphere was pleasant. A lot of the staff became friends uh, and role models for the boys, even to the point where we considered them to be more as brothers to us. I was able to start school again at AMI and progress with my senior year. Unfortunately, I turned 18 years old and aged out of foster care in April before the school year ended in May. I was missing half an English credit that I needed to graduate. When I came back to Bradenton, I made a deal with the principal at Bayshore High School. I would take an after school class at high school to get my credit, and if I could finish the course on time, I would be able to walk with my class from Bayshore at the graduation ceremony. I had two weeks to finish the semester of English and I achieved this goal in three days. <laughs> I walked with my classmates at the Manatee Civic Center, my guardian at Mark, right there on the sidelines cheering me on, taking photos, and watching me get my high school diploma. Once I graduated from Bayshore, I wanted to go into the workforce for a year before starting college. Mark mentioned that the owners of the Sunset Auto Group, Mr. and Mrs. Geyer, might hire me. 
I enter you with the general manager of the Cadillac location, Mr. J.J. Henthor, who is here today. He generously gave me a job as a lot boy. <laughs> my first few weeks involved cleaning up, trimming, and spraying weeds. I rode my bike every day about two and a half miles each way to work, as I don't have a car. Every weekend, my guardian and litem would take me out and practice driving. I only had a driving permit, and I really needed that driver's license to do the lap boy job at Sunset Cadillac. After a few weeks, Mark took me for my driving test, and I passed. I was very happy to receive my driver's license. <laughs> Eventually, I began taking photos of new vehicles, which I then posted onto the Sunset Cadillac website. I lived on the income from that job at an apartment in Bradenton, riding my bike every day. I had been working maybe two months with Sunset, and one day, I was dressed to go to work, and the sole of my shoe came loose. It basically fell off. <clears throat> the only other pair of shoes I had was flip-flops, and I couldn't wear those to work. I called my guardian and told him the situation, and he jumped in his car, and he met me at work 45 minutes later. He picked me up, and we were headed to Red Wing Shoes, and we bought the nicest boots that I've ever owned, and I still have them today. <laughs> I returned to work after missing only about two hours of work. Later, Mark told me the Children's Guardian Fund paid for the boots. I could never have afforded them on my own. About eight months of posting photos on the Sunset website, Mr. Henthorne asked me to help the Sarasota Kia location with their photos. The manager had seen my work and thought I could do a good job. Since I didn't have a car, they arranged for somebody to transport me. I was flattered that I was training someone else when just a few months earlier, I had been the rookie, the new guy. <clears throat> when I became a student at the Manti Technical College in August, I had to cut my hours at the Sunset Cadillac, and I'm studying culinary arts and really enjoy it. The Children's Gardening Fund helped me pay for the uniforms that I have for classes and also the chef boots that I wear today. The tuition is free for me as a foster youth, and as long as I keep my grades up, I'm given a check by the state to help me with rent and basic living expenses. And now that school has been in session for a while, I know what to expect and I have increased my hours back at Sunset Cadillac. As I close, I want you to know how much I appreciate all the help and encouragement I have and the opportunity I have to go to school. I love the smells, the flavors, and the creative challenge of the culinary experience. And Sunday, I intend to become the heart and soul of your favorite dining experience. <laughs> Thank you all for your help. Thank you all for helping me make this happen. Without organizations like the Children's Guardian Fund, life would be tougher for a guy like me who has plans of making something of himself. All of you are the stars in our lives. Thank you. You know, I mean, when I first saw Jesse and met him, I was just so impressed. And thank you, thank you. And just from the Children's Guardian Fund, we have a little thank you today and a recognition for doing this for us. Thank, thank you, you so Jesse. Much. I think Jesse has a lot of future customers in the room, right? We're all going to come visit you. What a great success story. Um, at, now it's the time in the program, then in just a moment, I'm going to invite Wendy Cox up to invite you to be involved. But um, on the way, I just couldn't resist introducing you to this little girl. Her name is Lyric. She's six years old in this picture. And the reason that she's in a hospital bed is because her mother tried to kill her, first by drowning her and then by stabbing her 14 times. And I know that's hard to think about, and, as, and I know you've had a lot of hard to think about moments in the room today, but I bring Lyric up because I want to tell you uh, about the hope, because Lyric is now seven, and I, as the prosecutor of her mother's case, got in with Ms. Fravelig, who's sitting here, had, uh, had an opportunity to spend quite a lot of time with Lyric, and I can tell you that she's healing, and she's starting to feel joy, and the Children's Guardian Fund is helping with that. Uh, her guardian, Kathy Clark, met her for the first time at All Children's Hospital when she was there being treated. And months later, we sat in a deposition and the defense attorney was asking Lyric questions and Kathy Clark was right by her side. And he said, 
how are you feeling when you were in the hospital? And she reached over and grabbed Kathy's hand or her arm and said, I was scared until she came. Well, Kathy Clark knows about the Children's Guardian Fund and knows Lyric very well and has made several requests on her behalf. So let me show you what we've been doing for her. This is Lyric riding a horse, bonding at horse camp, bonding with that magical animal and, and getting that really exhilarating experience. Here she is again. Here she is at cooking school, learning a skill, right? <laughs> Having someone pay attention to just her. Learning an activity, gaining confidence. I think, oh, is that the last one? Okay, so there she is. Um, there, sh Lyric also is in gymnastics. I can tell you that she is a very energetic child that has a lot of physical energy to get out, and she is getting stronger, and she f is gaining that confidence, and she walks even, even differently than she did when I met her a year ago. So thank you so much for being here today. That's what you're supporting. That's what, you're, uh, that's what the Children Guardi Children's Guardian Fund does. And isn't that an amazing investment? Doesn't she deserve that? <laughs> All right, so to close, I will turn it over to Wendy Cox, who is a, she has completed her second uh, term as a board member and is um, also on the host committee. Thank you. Great, thank you. <coughs> thank you, Andrea. That was a very powerful story. Certainly, this young girl is worth the investment. I think we can all agree on that. Well, I don't know about you, but I've been experiencing a wide range of emotion over our luncheon today. We've heard some really shocking statistics that have filled me with despair and a little anger over what is the situation that's going on out there and how can we help. We've heard about some tragic stories that have made my heart ache and my tears well up and I know I'm not the only one who felt that way. This is some pretty heavy stuff at this Children's Guardian Fund luncheon. And I think you come to hear what's really happening in our community, and I'm grateful that we have a room full of people who are really interested in what's going on. So at this point in the program, you could probably use something really light and happy, right? I could. Well, I'm here to deliver some positive and uplifting news for you. News that will make you three times as likely to live a longer and happier life. <laughs> now, I'm not changing the subject or anything just to get you to give us money. I would never do that, no. But I cannot control your actions at this point, and I'm sorry to say you will be giving more money after you hear this. Now, I read in the New York Times last week an article written in the opinion pages by the Dalai Lama. And he said, and I quote, in one shocking experiment, researchers found that people who did not feel useful to others were nearly three times as likely to die prematurely as those who did feel useful. We all need to be needed. So the good news for you here today is that you are needed and you are useful in supporting the kids that we've heard about. So if I'm interpreting that article correctly, you, every single person in this room, will live a longer and happier life starting now <laughs> if you make a donation to the Children's Guardian Fund before you leave this luncheon. Now that is great news. That is great news. And I'm happy to inform you that it's very easy to do. You can achieve a longer and happier and more fulfilled life in the next 90 seconds. <laughs> so now I feel like I'm giving an infomercial, you know. Great things are going to happen in the next 90 seconds. So let's all reach for our response cards. They're tucked carefully into your program. Everybody's got one on the table. So I'll just wait until everybody has the response card in their hand. And I'm in no big hurry, you know. I'll just sit up here waiting till I see activity at your tables. And please help your neighbor, because I've also read that helping others <laughs> can lead to a longer and happier life. So if your neighbor hasn't pulled out the response card, help them find it so that they can write something on it. 
And you'll notice on this response card, there are many ways you can be involved and help out. So you can become a guardian ad litem, like Jasmine. You, too, can visit people in jail on a regular basis. <laughs> you can volunteer and help us put on this great luncheon every year. And you can make a donation, because as Abby told us, when you donate, you change lives. So you can change lives here today, including your own, because you know you're going to be living longer and healthier. <laughs> so while you're checking out the response card options and writing your checks and pulling your credit cards out and your cash, everything out of your pockets, just put it right in that envelope, our Guardian Ad Litem staff is going to be walking around the room. I'm sure they're walking around the room now, picking up your response card. So all you need to do, pick up your response card, write on it, put it in the envelope, and just hold it up so that one of our staff members can come around and pick it up from you. So even if all you do is write a note of encouragement or support for our Guardian staff or our Guardian Ad Litems, that is something that is desperately needed. The Guardian staff that's wandering around, this is the easiest thing that they do all year. <laughs> Usually what they're doing is they're trying to help their guardians resolve very complicated issues that relate to the family situation, the legal situation. So for them to get a, a day to have a, a lunch and meet all of you is probably the best thing that's happened to them this week. So I want to thank all our Guardian staff members. And I also want to thank all of you who came to the luncheon today, those of you who sponsored the event, who served on our host committee, who purchased tables, who purchased tickets, who took time out of your day to spend it with us so that you could learn more about what's happening in your community. And um, for those who supported us in past years, thank you very much. We could not do this without you. We need everybody here in this room to make some sort of a supportive contribution to the work that's being done in our community. If everybody in this room, for example, gave a dollar, we have 341 people in this room, just think about how many work boots that that can buy a young person who is making a new career for himself. So as you're busy working on your response cards, we have this beautiful basket up here to continue my infomercial. Um, so we're going to have a raffle. Now, not all of you can win the raffle because, you know, there's only going to be a couple of winners. One winner? Just one winner. This is pressure. Um, but you'll notice you have a centerpiece on your table, and we'd ask that the host of each table take that centerpiece home because the centerpiece will have fulfilled its useful life with us at about 131, and we would like each centerpiece to have a new home. So if you can't be a foster parent, adopt a centerpiece here today. So I'm going to pick a name out of the basket for a raffle, or a number. OK, I hope it's not my own. All right, here's the moment of reckoning with your raffle ticket. Everybody got your raffle tickets? Everybody got your raffle tickets? If you didn't buy one, well, it might be too late now because you're not going to win because I've got the winning ticket. <laughs> I was looking for another way to get a donation. Okay, so here's the number, 9159785. Okay, I'm going to say it one more time unless you've got it. Does somebody have, somebody has it. Well, come on up. Is it Major Connie Shingledecker? No way. <laughs> Our keynote speaker from last year won the raffle. Yay. I want to call your attention to one more thing that's on your table. If you haven't noticed um, these little place cards that are in the middle of your table, it gives some examples of where the money goes. You've heard some today through the speeches, but this is what we, what we use some of the money for. And on the back, you'll see handwritten thank you notes from the kids that benefited from your donations. So just want you to take a look at those and appreciate how grateful these young children are. So congratulations, Connie. <laughs> And on behalf of the entire um, Children's Guardian Fund Board and the Advisory Board, 
I want to thank you all here for joining us for lunch today, for learning more about this important work that we do. And we hope that you will join us next year on Thursday, November 16th, at this luncheon again to hear more about the Children's Guardian Fund. And thank you all very much, and have a great afternoon. Thank you.